Welcome to the ETH2 Q&A session. Uh, what we're going to do is I, I'm going to ask some very, very basic questions just to get you all up to speed. And then I'm going to open the microphone to the crowd. Um, just a few things. I, uh, so like the, the whole thing about validator rewards and so on, uh, I don't know if you want to like dig into it. Otherwise, you know, I think it's consensus that we can skip the, those questions. Make sense? Yeah? Cool. All right. So uh, maybe let's start with Joe. <laughs> can, can you give us uh, an update uh, over the interop uh, locking and what you achieve and what that exactly means? Um, so we had a, um, this uh, lock-in, um, is what we called it. Um, it's kind of a workshop for a week out in um, Muskoka, Canada. Um, and <laughs> I guess we got somebody from Muskoka here. <laughs> nice. <laughs> All right. Woo. Yeah. So they're um, uh, 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 pretty. Um, so basically, the idea was that we like basically trap all the developers uh, in this place um, and uh, make them join our ETH2 cult, and then um, we'll work on our clients together um, and reduce the um, round trip time. Uh, for uh, communication for everybody on um, getting their clients to interop. Interop is essentially being able to um, uh, talk over libp2p to the individual clients and uh, gossip attestations and uh, block proposals uh, with um, validators kind of like shared among the individual clients. Uh, everything uh, that you need without syncing. And um, so uh, we were expecting, uh, I think, Eight clients came. Um, uh, seven uh, got to interop, um, and that was really exciting. I think we thought that there would probably only be three or four uh, that would uh, achieve interop in that time, which means that uh, all the uh, individual clients are really um, doing a great job. So um, I think that that uh, gives us more uh, a higher probability that we'll um, make. Uh, some uh, early Q1. Uh, don't quote that, but <laughs> but they they're, that's kind of like the the idea right now is where people are saying um, when they want to see a, a beacon chain up, and so I think there's higher probability of that now. Um, so just to give an update, does everyone know what uh, ETH2 is formed by? How many clients do we have, and all of that? I'm asking the crowd, because otherwise. We should give a primer. OK, like apparently everyone knows. <laughs> yeah? All right. So, um, so I, I don't know. Like, so we have a couple of the clients here. We have Nim, uh, Nimbus, we have uh, Lighthouse. We ha I, I just, like, I can't. Huh? What? The EF2 specification. The EF2 <laughs> specification team. We have a Lodestar as well, and we have. Anyone else? Artists. Uh, oh, art, oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Trinity. 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 OK. Quilt. Who are prototyping phase one and two. Quilt is here. They're prototyping phase one and two on Lighthouse. All right. Uh, which of the clients is the one that's most advanced? <laughs> 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 Lodestar does a really good job at fuzzy testing other clients. <laughs> we, we, we blow them up. Like, yeah. Lighthouse thought they weren't going to, you know, panic. We made them panic. <laughs> they fixed it. We made them panic again. <laughs> Lodestar, best client of all time? Oh, no. <laughs> that, no. That, that's what we got? Best in the browser. <laughs> All right, uh, do the existing clients uh, here want to give a really quick update? Maybe we start with, uh... <laughs> OK, we don't start with you, Yasek. <laughs> uh, yeah, Nimbus. Uh, first of all, yeah, thanks to Consensus and, and, and the organizers of the Interop. It was really, really, really good to get together there. Um, work out a lot of the practical little details that have to be worked out when you're trying to make two pieces of software work. You think that it's easy, like there's a spec, everybody just writes the code and then you know boots it up and it works. Um, that's obviously not the way it works. Uh, 
we have a pretty complex product coming out. Uh, and there are very many basic building blocks that have to fall into place, like that's the networking, that's the cryptography, that's the spec itself. Um, and I think really valuable was finding out and using each other's clients as stress tests, as a first sort of fuzz testing platform, um, so that we could feel out where the other clients have put their effort the most. And then that's how we could improve our own client to sort of match that level. Um, so I think Interrupt was great for this. We found lots of bugs, lots of issues, lots of places where um, the thinking was not consistent between the clients. And that was sorted out during that Interrupt. I mean, there was a lead up to the Interrupt where, where clients were sort of pairing off and trying to um, solve some of the initial things to make it smooth, right? So we, that's, that's probably why we saw so many successes right on the spot as well. Like, yeah. Thank you. Artemis? Um, so uh, after Interop, we uh, ripped out our uh, Rust implementation of libp2p. Um, we're the Java client, so we went for the JVM libp2p um, that was built by Harmony. Uh, and we put that in, um, and now we're kind of working on um, some uh, uh, sync issues and some uh, implementation issues uh, to kind of get ready. We're turning um, our, our team over to start working on a sharding client. Um, and we're uh, uh, leaving our beacon chain client with the production team who's going to kind of like get the um, more hard end for production. Um, and uh, yeah, that's kind of where we are. Um, uh, we're going to work on a new sharding client that's going to be built in Kotlin, um, just super set of Java and uh, also compiles to machine code. Loadstar? Uh, yeah. Uh, after Interop, uh, we started, we kind of broke into several different sub teams. Uh, we're working on getting Loadstar kind of productionized. Uh, we have a lot of optimization to do to really get to like this production level that Danny was talking about. Um, and we also were just kind of looking ahead at uh, light client work. So uh, we start, we've started to uh, prototype some of that work out, and uh, we're hopefully going to start contributing back to the spec a little bit. Thank you. Lighthouse. Uh, we're going well. Uh, our main focus at the moment is to target feature completeness, uh, so phase zero feature completeness. Um, we're getting quite close. We're just uh, sort of polishing off the integration to F1 to the deposit contract. Uh, we're also working on um, some slashing protection for validators. Um, so this is kind of uh, the idea of feature complete being that we can run the protocol. We, 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 can, we have everything we need to run, and we can run off the deposit contract, uh, but not necessarily can we run for, say, a year and use reasonable disk usage. Um, so that's something we're working on now is uh, trying to figure out how to optimize our database storage so that, so that we can run for a long time. Um, yeah, so I think the, the next thing for us is we really need to start uh, testing more public test nets. We need to get one of our own public test nets up. Uh, and we also need to start doing uh, test nets with other clients using the F1 chain as the source of, of deposits. Um, so we can test this like dynamic uh, validator set, because this is the thing that we didn't test at Interop. Um, so yeah, that's that's us, and we're we're also really trying to uh, help foster the the quilt team to to make sure that they can keep researching the the next phases um, whilst still delivering phase zero. Uh, yeah, so Trinity was an interop. Uh, we had a lot of fun working with everyone. Uh, since then, we've been just sort of merging in all the things we found there. Nothing major, but just a lot of like tiny little things, as I'm sure other people found. Uh, the big thing for us will be performance. So Trinity is a client written in Python. So while it's great in terms of being readable and very approachable and accessible, uh, we definitely have to deal with sort of this performance penalty we accept by choice. Uh, so that'll be a lot of our work moving forward for the next couple months is making really fast interpreted code. Cool, thank you. I am uh, losing my voice, so excuse me. Um, so. 
Uh, the Quilt team has been focused on doing research around phase two, um, building on execution environments, um, and doing some early prototypes um, on uh, basically the stateless paradigm. So we are already building execution environments that are um, operating with um, in a stateless way. Um, and we built a simulation um, within Lighthouse's kind of base code base where we now have shard chains or multiple shard chains interacting with the beacon chain. Um, and we're able to actually run the state execution on that as well and run these execution environments on it as well. And so we have been, um, I guess kind of what, what we're doing next is expanding that to include more simulations of what um, the, the state market might look like, um, advancing on what may be uh, EEs for some of those contract frameworks as well. Um, yeah. Uh, and do you guys want to give an update? Yeah, we're working on all sorts of things. Um, adding, add some additional tests to phase zero. Uh, Justin Drake did some excellent work making phase one look really nice and easy to reason about and elegant. Um, a lot of research and thought and conversations around phase two. Um, and more recently, some conversations around um, potential alternate structures with phase one that might allow um, more rapid cross-linking and, and better communication between shards. Um, at the same time, working on some standards, uh, helping drive the standards process on BLS. Uh, Carl's been looking into key store formats, uh, pushing on the deposit contract stuff, which is uh, formally verified and, and ready, but we're waiting on the BLS standardization uh, to launch that. Um, and opening up the conversations around the coming public test nets uh, with, with the clients, and, and always kind of providing support and uh, answering questions uh, on the client side. Um, so just keeping everything moving forward. Yeah, and I've been coming up with these uh, of alternate structures for faster cross-linking that Danny mentioned that we should have some information out, um, out about me, me, maybe very soon. Um, also, data availability. There's uh, yes, thank you. Data avail There's been a lot of uh, kind of progress on different kinds of data availability proving mechanisms. There was also that uh, interesting coded Merkle tree paper from. A, uh, a couple of days ago that lets you do erase your coded roots with uh, much smaller fraud proofs, which is also a really, which is also really nice. Um, also, we're uh, thinking about uh, fee market simplif uh, simplification and coming and coming up with uh, ways to and uh, deal with edge cases in real real your markets and all of those issues. I guess um, I've been thinking about um, optional well, upgrades. Um, one of them is um, the idea of a secret uh, leader election. So right now, um, Beacon proposes and Shaw proposes, they're known in advance that they're going to cr create a block. And then these, these leader-based systems suffer from um, denial of service uh, attack surface. Um, and so what if we can have a system where you don't know ahead of time who will be creating the next block? That would be much more resilient. Um, another kind of optional security upgrade that I've been working on for some time and it's still ongoing and we're making lots of progress is the, the VDF project to have uh, unbiasable randomness. Uh, and I guess I've also been thinking, you know, maybe a decade into the future on, um, on E3 and how to make um, Ethereum qu quantum secure. At least 10 years, I'd say. Dan Bonet says 30. But Dan also said, don't quote me on that. <laughs> uh, all right, I'm going to open up now to questions from the audience. Uh, who want to go first? Sure. Uh, um, you mentioned you're doing a lot of work on fee markets. Uh, one thing that I would love to see is a bit of a high level abstraction so that you can specify how fast you want a transaction to happen. Like I want it to happen in a minute or five minutes or an hour or I don't care. And then, 
and then it bills you like however much it should the market rate would be for that. Like you could pay more and then it would refund you the difference. Because right now it's guesswork. Like trying to trying to you know guess the right amount of gas. Uh, well, although the so gas. I the think uh, this is the sort of problem that EIP one five five nine is meant to basically eliminate. Like users would in the normal case see their transactions just included immediately. Anyone else? Questions? Oh. Oh, okay, we have cable, so can you come over, please? Uh, my name is Chi. I actually have a question. So uh, the number of straws, I, to my understanding, is we start with 1024. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering why, why I choose this number, especially together with a large number of validators. There will be significant costs to network costs, especially at the starting uh, of the ESA2. Is there any concern that maybe we may not be able to reach so many nodes or validators? At the beginning, so. And so, this is one of the one of the things that this kind of faster cross-linking proposal might actually end up changing potentially. But I think, in general, the justification here is that we're trying to kind of. Like th there's two different kind of constraints that we have. One of the constraints is the load on the beacon chain. Um, so we want to like. The higher the shard count, the more scalability. But on the other hand, the higher the shard count, the more crosslinks on the beacon chain, and the more expensive the beacon chain will be to process. And the other constraints that we have is just like the higher the total throughput of the system, the higher the harder it is to be like a, a, to be a block explorer. The higher the risk that some historical data will eventually just end up being forgotten completely, and so forth. So. The scalability that we that we're expecting, like the data throughput that we're expecting, the number that we've quoted, like we've quoted numbers between one to ten megabytes per second, and that seems kind of to be close to the upper, upper limit of people of uh, like what people are fine with so far. And for the load on the beacon chain, like we've done numbers, and it seems like beacon chain blocks can, in the worst case, be verified in like about a about a second now. Is it? So, yeah, so once again, it's a kind of like that much but not more sort of thing. Yeah, I think there was like four million validators were starting to encroach over a second, so mm -hmm. that's yeah. way above what we'll get. Yeah, and like I personally want to be conser want to be conservative with beacon chain numbers. So like I want to, I, I personally really want to avoid the mistake that we made of like in ETH one, where like because the chain was heavy, like so few people wants to run a node. Like I would prefer a beacon chain node to be just a thing that you would run by default rather than like running only when you need it. And that does necessitate kind of fairly like stringent performance requirements. Yeah, I agree. Things that are faster are harder to DOS to. I mean, on the concern that there won't be enough validators to start with, we're essentially handling that by only doing the genesis once we have sufficient validators. So we'll, the current numbers are 65,000 validators, 2 million ETH. Um, another idea that we're considering is that even even if we go for a thousand shards in the very long term, um, we could you know we could slowly. Um, enable them, ratchet that up. So start maybe with 64 shards, and then over time uh, have it increase. Because at the very beginning, there's going to be very little activity, and it, it might be worth um, using less shards. Yeah, speaking of block times, or, or process, block processing times, it's, it's important to remember that there are cases where we have to process blocks which are not necessarily good ones, that might be spammed, might be maliciously constructed that takes time away. So we need to have a little bit of a buffer. Um, and that also affects the way that messages propagate in the network. So we're using uh, an epidemic network, which basically means that all the data is replicated all over the network. And the longer it takes to process, or the longer a full block processing takes, the the less validation we can do ahead of time, meaning that the more uh, risk there is that the data, that the network will be flooded by bad data, or that it will be slow. Either of those two, right? So, so there's also that argument that if we can do more good validation upfront and still maintain low latencies, 
we also gain in other parts of the system as a whole. Uh, yeah, so I'm wondering what the plan is in general terms for handling of ERC-20 assets. Um, in particular, the transfer functions. As a developer, it's somewhat difficult from a user experience standpoint. And there's been many proposals. Uh, ERC-223, for instance, has an interesting proposal. Um, but as we transition to E2.0, I'm curious what the general plan is for uh, handling those assets, because there's just hundreds of them. Just migrating them to 223 isn't sort of feasible. But curious your thoughts. <coughs> So kind of unrelated to the whole transfer from thing, which I agree needs to be reformed somehow, another issue, like another reason why things need to be reformed anyway is that assets are probably the major category of application that we expect like any particular token will need to be accessible in all shards. Like most applications, like, real, like realistically, unless you're in the top 10, you could just live inside of one shard and you could expect people to just move their coins to your shard, do stuff inside of your application and then go somewhere else. But tokens need to be able to move, be moved around everywhere. And so like the idea of a token as being a balance of one particular monolithic contract is not something that can really survive. And so you'd expect like token holdings to themselves kind of be more like individual contracts. And when like when that happens, like you're pretty much like it, it's an opportunity to kind of reform other things about how the standard works as well. Another question I had, just to um, go back to Justin. Um, you you just a minute ago mentioned that it could start with 64 shards. And previously, I hadn't heard this. So can you expand on that a little bit more as to how that could happen? Because Previously, the response was that it, you'd be underutilizing it, but is that really the only consideration, that you'd be underutilizing the beacon chain, the, the throughput that, that's made available? Like, Why couldn't we start with a lower number and then scale up? Or would you have like validators sitting out and not really activated? I mean, the validators do all sorts of things. Uh, one of them is cross-linking. And so technically speaking, to reduce the number of shards is pretty trivial. Like, When they do the cross-link, some of the, these crosslinks will just be hard coded to zero, and that will this zero hash will mean that there's just no data flowing through the the, the respective shards. Um, but you know these validators would still be providing value. For example, they'd be contributing towards the finality of the beacon chain and all sorts of other things. Um, I mean, one one good reason to to start with lower shards is and lower count is that you know maybe more network stability. We wouldn't have so many shard su uh, subnets. Uh, that that's a nice thing. Also, also, it allows for for services like like block explorers to give them a bit of breathing space to to ramp up to to bigger numbers. As to how we increase to a higher number of shards, we can have some sort of automatic schedule or we could um, kind of push this to the social, social consensus layer um, with, with hard forks. So this is a possibility that it could start much lower? Yes, and I think it's the natural thing to do, I think. Right, it, yeah, because yeah, I've heard from many people and I'm sympathetic to the idea that um, block space should be economically valued or it has economic implications. Mm -hmm. um, and it should be valued highly and if you have a, a an abund overabundance of it, then you end up devaluing the transactions that mm -hmm. are contained in it. Um, I mean, that's a good point. If we have few, fewer shards, it means that we can really test uh, the new um, you know, gas market with VIP 1159, uh, which, by the way, is awesome. It just seems to solve so many problems. Um. <coughs> Hi, I'm Kent. I'm the head of R&D at uh, Shapeshift. And I'd love to hear uh, more from you, Vitalik, about the use of uh, phase one in a data availability context. This, this excites me a lot because um, it, it seems to me that a lot of the really vexing challenges with E2.0 are, are in phase two with sharded EEs and cross-chain cross um, communication. Uh, this could effectively really give us a, a very nice bridge where we have uh, layer two solutions with Starks and Snarks. Um, so kind of a two-fold question. Uh, to what, what extent is um, the data availability aspect being spec'd out and built with those particular use cases in mind? And also, if you could shed, shed, uh, shed some light on the big research challenges and, and uh, questions as that aspect is built out. 
Sure. Um, so there exists a scalability solution already. Like um, Plasma Group is doing a demo of it. Like a, I think at DEF CON uh, called um, Optimistic Rollup. And Optimistic Rollup basically works by publishing uh, transaction data in a very compressed form on chain, but not doing like state ex execution on chain. And optimistic, but because you avoid executing, you only have a little bit of data, and especially because data is relative, is like very cheap relative to computation. Even on the ETH one system, you can achieve scale like uh, scalability of like ten to hundred x. Like the theoretical max throughput is somewhere around three thousand TPS if like everyone were to just use optimistic rollup for moving coins around, and. ETH2 could potentially take, make optimistic rollup even more powerful because instead of using the ETH1 chain's data store to store, uh, to store this data to make sure that it's available, you would be storing that data on the ETH2 chain and you would basically kind of feed into the ETH1 side Merkle proofs that prove that, hey, this data actually has been accepted by ETH2. And so if you imagine, like even if say we reduce the shard count and they're like even the scalability at the beginning is toward the lower end and say there's one megabyte per second of data availability, then if we talk about say 20 byte transactions, then that's 50,000 transactions a second that could fit inside of a roll up. And that's, uh, and it's like a, a system that could like, the yeah, logic for for kind of doing it is something that is being developed already. I think the main challenge that would need to be solved is that you would need to have at least a minimal sort of fee market on, on the ETH2 side so that um, optimistic rollup relayers would at least have the ability to kind of pub, uh, publish uh, their data. And like, that is one of the things we're actively thinking about. Well, and the other challenge is if you do want to use phase one as a data availability layer of on ETH1, you need to go down the finality gadget road and expose uh, ETH2 data, ETH2 state routes to ETH1 so you can make proofs against it. So um, depending on, as we talked about in the last session, depending on kind of parallel roadmaps and how long expected things are going to take, it may or may not be worth it. Right. Next question. Martin. Hey, Martin. You need to actually jump, everyone. Um, yeah, so I came a little late. So I hope this question hasn't been asked. Um, if so, I'll just excuse myself. But the question is um, around the process by which a particular execution environment is chosen for a shard. If there's like some auction going on or renting that space. Um, and also what might happen if you need to change something about the execution environment, like forking it or something like that. So with um, all of, what, what in all of the proposals we're considering so far, I think blocks would have the ability to contain space for multiple execution env uh, kind of env uh, environment uh, spaces in them. And so basically like you would expect like, it's ultimately the block proposer that chooses what to include, and like, different people would uh, would be able to bid. But like you would expect, you know, if at least popular execution environments to have a a, a presence and like, be executed even in, in every slot in the sh uh, the shards in in which they're located. Yeah. So to be clear, the execution environment is defined on the beacon chain and thus available on all of the shard chains. And so when you make a block, you're kind of signaling this block is for this execution environment, and thus the data in this block or chunk of data, maybe multiple, is for that um, execution environment. And so you can kind of think of, say, this, uh, this block was for execution environment A, this block was for execution environment B, and the next one was for A. Like the actual blockchain of A is like this, this subset of the, the actual shard chain. Um, and on the forking, I think, um, so the nice thing about it is you could actually define migration paths such that you could deploy a new EE and have some sort of migration from uh, previous EE to new EE. And I do expect these things to kind of emerge in, in a standards, standards way, kind of like in the ERC uh, standards. But 
I could also see that certain EEs, especially like the ETH1 EE, uh, could still maybe be subject to hard forking uh, to upgrade and manipulate, depending on the kind of social dynamic around that. So does that require uh, forking the beacon chain as well? Or is yes, yes. So I'm saying that would be a, like, to, to actually change an EE would require um, kind of changing, changing the actual code of, of the protocol in an irregular state change. Um, there are options to migrate and upgrade EEs without doing that, but there it might still be like a social tool to coordinate and manipulate these things. Will, will the EEs be permissioned, or like, is are you not going to? So, if you want to add a new EE, do you need to fork anything, or can you just add new EEs? You can just, and there will be a large transaction fee or deposit requirements, so we, the beacon chain doesn't get filled up too much. But like anyone, like yeah, you know, will would be able to do it. So you're not auctioning them like some other guys. Uh, and does, are you expecting applications? <laughs> are you expecting applications, some of the bigger ones, to have their own EE? Possible. Yeah, possible. Some, a lot of. A lot of like the reasons you might have an EE, like it, it doesn't actually make sense, and it might just make sense to operate within an EE. Uh, but I do funny that you asked that. I have thought it could be like certainly an, a way to advertise, like if the casino has their own EE, come join us. Uh, yeah, like a gaming EE. I mean, there's probably yeah, some yeah, yeah. some data that we would want to store that no one else wants to store. Yeah, maybe so. so. Yeah. yeah. Or. Uh, Maybe not data, but more like how you optimize the structure of accessing certain things. Yeah, a uh, fraction yeah, yeah. of a second block time would be really good. <laughs> yeah, I've, I think it might be like another tier of developer that makes an EE. It might be someone that's working like really deeply in protocol research or like zero knowledge proof research or something. They really know what they're doing and they can't do it anywhere else and then they'll go to that. But then you're like kind of typical developer that's at the application layer would probably want to stay away from it. Any other question from the audience? I mean, while oh, we're waiting sorry. for a question, um, I mean, maybe to put a bit of cold water on the whole E, like, I mean, it's the E is a like, beautiful piece of layer of abstraction um, and very useful in the context of migrating in if one into if two. But there is also the possibility that um, you know EEs, you know, you know, add extra friction between them in addition to the friction between shards and you know, you know, there's also the possibility that we'll have unsustainable EEs. So uh, EEs, for example, without uh, state rent, um, similar to what we have right now in EF1, and if they become popular, then, you know, it, it's all sorts of complicated questions. So it is possible that, at least in the short and medium term, we will roll out with some sort of default enshrined EE, some sort of, you know, native EF2 EE, which just acts and behaves like uh, somewhat like if one does today and, and you won't have that much room to play with uh, in the medium term and then in the long term we open up the EEs to everyone right but how do you manage that process of opening up to everyone right well that will happen under consensus layer and one day we say hey anyone can can publish an EE um, so you know this, going back to the permissioning question maybe the you know the, yeah, no one will be able to publish EEs for some time. I'm not saying it will happen, but it's a possibility. All right, questions? How much thought has there been to uh, transparent sharding where app developers don't have to um, figure out which shard they want to be on? Because if you give them that choice, maybe they'll just all choose to be on the same shard. I mean, that's one of the, the, the really good benefits of opening up to EEs is that all this innovation on transparent sharding can be done at the application layer. And us as consensus like designers, we don't have to, to bother about that. Um, and so if, if, if you know, Nair or Polkadot or whatever comes up with some cool innovation that can be integrated with fairly little friction. Um, and there's already ideas out there for um, you know, using the shards as you know, fungible data availability resource um, that can be used um, and kind of de decoupling the, the the logical centralization of the application from the underlying resource which is sharded. But who decides where the application goes? Like, does the application get to decide what shard it goes on? Or is it, do they have no control over that? 
I mean, at, at, the, at the low level, the, every, the E lives in the beacon chain, and it, it's made accessible to every shard. But then, you know, then it, it, it becomes a question of uh, for the DApp developers, how do they want to, you know, either you know restrict themselves to a specific shard, um, or, or have some sort of virtual EE or virtual virtual execution environment, which is separate from the, the, the consensus level uh, concept. Also within EE development, there's, there's a few things you can do and you know, when, when this opens up as well. Um, I think there are a couple questions. So one, one question is, do you have to deploy to the beacon chain and do you also have to deploy to multiple shards um, or do you automatically have it available across all the shards? Um, so that's one piece. But also within your execution environment, you could technically build um, some basic level of scheduling yourself as well, um, saying I will only operate certain, um, you know, certain transactions um, on shard five for you know this series of epics, or shard five, six, and seven for this series of epics. Um, so there's a lot of flexibility in how how you can write these and how you may be able to enforce load balancing. Uh, yourself just within the semantics behind an execution environment. Are we going to retain the um, financial Lego uh, that we've got of um, plug and play between uh, composability? Uh, are we losing that or, or um, compromising that with the sharding? From a tooling perspective? Uh, well, right now you can, you know, you can plug uh, compound and die together or something. Um, if you don't know, if, if your Lego blocks are now on different shards and they can't interop without um, cross shard links, which might be slower and have some penalty. I, so I think that, like, I mean, I get the concern, but I think like all of the kind of DeFi integrations, like for just as one example, I've seen in practice, I don't think any of them really break from asynchrony. One of the reasons why is that half of these integrations just happen to do with like one system containing a token from another system. But tokens are a thing that's like the, probably easier than anything else to move across shards. You just like yank the contract over in like one, one Merkle branch and it's, and it's like somewhere else wherever you want it to be. Um, I think the thing that, and then if you look at like even Uniswap, for example, it just moves tokens around. You move the tokens to the Uniswap shard, swap it, move a token somewhere else. So most of the, the integrations do kind of work like work that way. The, the ones that don't are basically the ones that involve kind of synchronously calling other, app, um, other applications, but like, even in that case, a lot of a lot of the calls are like do tends to be asynchronous, or at least would be perfectly fine if you did them in did them in an asynchronous way. So, at least like given the applications that we know about, I think that's a kind of a small like a, a smaller risk than a lot of people think. I mean, I could see like execution environment fragmentation being an e a, a, even a bigger issue than shard frag than shard fragmentation if not handled correctly, and that's like, and it's definitely something that we're thinking very actively about how to smooth over. And I mean, concretely, it might turn out that cross chain communication is actually faster on Eve two than a, you know an Eve one transaction. Right, if one on average is 15 seconds, and you know, two ways that we could have fast cross shard communication is one, we have this new proposal where we have cross links in every slot on the beacon chain. You know, we, we might have cross cross chain um, communication in just uh, just a few slots, um, and then the other way, kind of which is generic, um, is to use optimistic cross links, uh, where basically you have some sort of off-chain mechanism to gauge the probability that some cross-link will eventually make it into the beacon chain and get finalized, but you don't have 100% probability um, that will happen, and then you, you can design your application around that and, and, and benefit from the, the low latency. Can you do any some kind of automated garbage collection and start moving smart contracts that want to be on the same chain together so that they're faster? Um, so, 
I, I generally think the space, um, the cross interaction around multiple shards, I think uh, there should generally be a set of tooling um, within the HLLs or DSLs that are used, so within Solidity, Viper, um, anything else. Um, so from a DAP developer perspective, if you accept asynchronous as you know, the basic concept, construct of communication across shards, you can have tooling that does that through message passing. Um, you could have tooling that does that through you know, a two-phase commit you know, system if you need some type of atomic transaction. Um, you could have you know, tooling that, so it, I think from a DAP developer's perspective, you're going to have more tooling in these languages that, that you would go ahead and, and utilize for the problem that you need, um, so. Um, yeah, how do uh, the, the archive nodes look like for F2 and are block explorers ready for this? If you're a block explorer, you would pretty much have to like, download every block on every shard, which is one to 10 megabytes per second, multiplied by 86,400, and we're talking 80 to 100 uh, gigabytes a day. So it's like, you have, like, you, you have like more hardware requirements. Um, <laughs> the, um, and then, of course, so, so that like that's one issue: the higher hardware requirements going up. Um, and uh, another issue is that um, you'll have to deal like a, a kind of under like with ETH two. Basically, more things are being kind of layer twoified than before. So like, you have execution environments, and then within execution environments, like we're also planning to push forward on transaction abstraction. And so now you don't like you don't have EOAs and contracts as different classes of things anymore. And then you have cross shard transactions and different ways of implementing them. And so your responsibility to kind of understand popular layer two protocols will re realistically end up increasing. And that's another thing that you might need to watch that you'll probably need to watch out for. So I guess, yeah, like in general, for like being a general purpose block explorer is like realistically is one of the things that will get harder. All right, we have uh, time for one last question. Make it quick. So as a DAP developer that has an ERC-20 asset, uh, is there anything specifically we should do or maybe not do as we look towards E2.0? Right now, no. And in the like in the future, when I think I'm inclined to just say like don't like don't think about the problem now, and like in the future, as the ex execution environments uh, kind of start becoming more nailed down, then you'll be able to kind of think more about like how to design design the kind of token and like application specific details around a cross shard context. But no migration specifically. Mm, like. There is a possibility you'll have to do a one-time token upgrade, but that could also be done with a wrapper. Hmm. Yeah. Now, knowing that tokens are the most uh, used function in the current chain, is it not worth considering hard coding them and like making them much more efficient than they are right now? Or taking a snapshot, potentially. And would hard coding make them more efficient? Well, because right now they execute code just to do basic functionality of and the token. The code is like fairly small, right? Like execution of EVM code is not like a dominant factor of uh, like blockchain over overhead time. Like the one, th okay, so the thing that I would look into, like if we want to like really optimize tokens heavily, things that I would look into, I mean, one is to just like review like the whole ERC-20 transfer from architecture and like think hard about, do we want to build into high, like higher level of language standards, a more explicit like pay for token with function calling um, strategy? Another thing to look into is that, um, Actually, one kind of functionality that I think we'll, li we'll likely put in is the ability to store pieces of contract code on the beacon chain um, and then have the ability to just reference them by address. 
and this would like de like this would prevent things like account abstraction, like tokens not being abstracted and or tokens already being abstracted and all these other things from blowing up witness sizes because you'll instead of ha having a piece of code in your witness, you'll just be able to point to an index. So a lot of those gains have kind of been factored into the existing design already. Um, another thing to look into uh, would be kind of redesigning user accounts so that you would have the benefit of uh, kind of being able to, to like you would be able to get the efficiency benefits of being able to hold m like many units of a token within one particular package that could get passed around between shards but like there's trade-offs there right because like from a privacy point of view if you want to improve your privacy it actually makes sense to kind of separate out all of all of of your token holdings from from each other and even have multiple accounts per token. So it's like in general I feel like there's a way like the optimizations are needed, but there's generally ways to make the optimization without enshrining too many things. Well and it's important to note the the notion of owning Ether actually becomes a layer two concept in EEs. So the only thing that owns EEs is the, act the EE. The EE has a balance. And then there's some sort of, presumably, some sort of account model and state model within that EE that's defined that allows you to actually have a right to a portion of that Ether. And so we've actually, instead of enshrining tokens, we're now like deshrining okay. Ether within, within the EE. All right, we oh. have to stop here. Sorry, uh, everyone. Uh do you want to talk? Less hard coded things at the end of the day is better. Yep. You know, so like yeah. not having like a e you know like a ERC hard coded is just going to be better cuz less hard forks less nonsense to deal with from a PM perspective.